Wow. What do you know about waterborne paint? Nothing? Most people don't know nothing about waterborne paint. Most people don't care about waterborne paint. I don't really care either, but I know some stuff about it, though. It's kind of an odd thing. Um, in, uh, that's a nice ratchet, hey? Look at that sum of a bitch. In uh, Europe is where it started. Um, first waterborne paints that I heard about in North America, I'm in Kanadistan, Canada, um, were Sickens products. And they, uh, they come from uh, Denmark, I believe. Yeah. And they were the first ones that I heard about doing it. They were the first ones to do a lot of stuff. Um, the first high solids primer that I ever saw in my life was uh, Sickens 3 plus 1. And that come from Denmark. Anyways, over, over there, over yonder... They're kind of concerned about their environments and all kinds of stuff. So I think that's why they did this, was to keep the chemicals out of the air. But uh, in North America here, um, not so much. I mean, we care now that it's uh, uh, everything environmental is a big catchphrase now. So we care now. But uh, for years and years and years, we didn't really give a shit. So... Uh, from what I saw, because I've been hanging around the trade a long time, and uh, when I started in the trade, we used lacquer primer. So I saw the high solids primers come in, the 2Ks with the hardener and everything. I saw that stuff come in. I saw all kinds of stuff. And I saw waterborne come in too. And uh, in North America, from what I witnessed, um, the waterborne paints... And, and all that kind of, I mean, the, the industry got all kinds of shit introduced all about the same times. But, uh, so like I'm saying, in Europe, they, they done it for the environment. In North America, it was just done really out of greed. That's, that's, that's how it happened, was, uh, that's the way greed evolved. And I'll explain that to you. So what gradually happened over the years as the paints developed is uh, in order to sell more product everything all the products that we used because auto body is a product based it's a labor and product based um, industry there you go it's an industry because I mean everything's paint and primers and everything's you do and stuff so uh, um, to make more money one of the ways they made more money is they just gradually and steadily made everything that you have to have that you have to use they made it all less and less efficient years and years ago you could mix up some paint like this thing was painted i think in 1986 1987 and i'll bet you there ain't but two coats of red paint on this and it's done um the majority of paints nowadays as as they progressed you had to put more and more and more on because the paint got thinner and thinner and thinner and it got more translucent um, They put less and less meat in the sandwich. Let's put it that way So so you had to put more and more coats of paint on and They made it they got into the base coats and all that kind of stuff um, Those they got into base coats more for color technology to get your fancier colors and stuff you couldn't do that with single stage paint because you couldn't float the metallics and the pearls and get everything to stay on the surface. So it reflected the sun to give you all these amazing, remarkable colors that looked like 13 year old girls nail polish. So what they had to do was they had to get some shit that you could spray on there that poof would flash off quick so that all those things that they put in the paint would stay on the surface. The metallics, the pearls, all that stuff would stay up high in the paint so the sun would hit it so it would reflect. If you're putting on, so this, like I said, this is a single stage paint. If you're putting on a heavy single stage paint where everything hits it in, in one coat, well, it goes on in a heavy liquid and all those little things, they'll settle into that liquid and you'll lose them. So that's, that's why they developed the base coat. So then as the base coat carried on, like I said, they just made it less and less efficient. And so they sold more and more product and made more and more money. So what happened one day, and all this stuff always seems to stem from California, hey? 
it's kind of a funny thing, but I mean, peanut butter is known to cause cancer in the state of California, so whatever. But one day down there in California, I believe, they started sniffing. Um, they started going up on in, into the exhaust systems of these shops and uh, into the paint booth exhaust, and they started sniffing what these shops were pumping out into the environment. And somebody said, holy shit, because, like I say, as they made things more less and less efficient, well, more and more of it, uh, I need to pay attention to what I'm doing here, more and more of it uh, blew off into the environment. So it's just blown straight out the roof of the shop. So they didn't like that. So then they forced them, they said, well, you got to do something, because you can't just keep polluting the environment like that. <sighs> So who, who has to do something? The paint companies. Who else is going to do something? Nobody else knows how to make it. So the paint company said, oh, just wait. We can do stuff. So then they took the technology from Europe and they brought it over here. And they started making waterborne paints over here. And they took the opportunity because uh, if you change something, what's the first thing you can do? Well, you can raise the prices, can't you? So they made waterborne paint and they doubled the price of bloody well everything that's that's available to you. Um, but basically, if you get the gist of it, like that's, that's, that's what happened is uh, they made the paints, the solvent-borne paints, so inefficient that they got caught blowing them into the atmosphere, right? So your base coats are light, so they float in the air forever. And in a paint booth, that fan takes all that base coat mist and it blows it right out. Um, so then the paint companies, well, they're running the show when it comes to that shit, right? So they kind of almost even dictated as to what they can change. Because to my knowledge, currently still, nobody uses a waterborne clear coat. Sickens did have one for a while, but it didn't work very well here. I don't really know why. I think it's because we're in too much of a hurry over here. Um, I know of a couple of shops that used a waterborne clear coat. And um, when they would clear something... The next day or the day after that, when they would go to sand out some dirt nibs or something out of it, they'd sand it out, they'd polish it, and it looked really good. They'd go back the next morning, and it would look like it was unpolished. Weird, hey? Um, like where they sanded, it was sanded again. I don't know. Who knows? Didn't last, though. They didn't, the waterborne did not last here, and that was, that was the biggest reason that I heard of was stuff like that made it unworkable, and the time frames just didn't work with, with our production. Because you got you to gotta get shit out, right? That's how you make money. Time is money, so you got to knock that shit out of there. So there's no time for screwing around with that. Um, that's one of the problems in waterborne paint as well, is you have, you have a, a, an envelope of time to work in with waterborne paint. There, there is, I mean, it's basically, it's, it's a, uh, um, what the hell's house paint? It's basically, it's just a fancy latex is all it is. So you have a window of opportunity where your clear coat will chemically adhere to it. Um, if you hit it too soon, your clear coat will peel because it hasn't flashed off enough. And there's, there's like a liquid barrier there and your clear coat hardens up, but your waterborne paint ain't hardened up underneath and the clear comes off of it. And if you leave your waterborne paint set too long, it shells over too hard and the clear coat will not interlink, it will not chemically bond to that top coat. You see a lot of clear coat peeling nowadays, it's one of those two reasons. It's waterborne base coat and they either cleared it too soon or too late. Because you have a, you like I said, just said you you have a window that you can work in, and that's and you got to work in that window. Um, so it doesn't work good. And like I said, we brought it all on ourselves because greed, because everybody wanted to make more money. It's not good enough that you can take home three million dollars a year. You got to be able to take home six times more money than you'll ever be able to spend in a lifetime. And what are you going to do with it all? And that's you know that's that's what happened. So. Uh, Basically, once that started happening and the waterborne side of the industry started proving, holy jeez, son of a bitch. Once the waterborne side of things started looking less and less user friendly to everybody, holy jumpins. Well, then, uh, oh. Let me let my back decompress for a second here. Crikey. So 
some of the companies started looking at it, and I mean, they know what they've done, so they just started going backwards again. I mean, now we're getting to the point, like I have a solvent-born base coat system here. It's Matrix that I have here. And this system has gone back to, there are certain colors there that, like the color is there in one coat. There's, I've, I've, I've sprayed colors here that I've gone in with my little light after one coat, and holy shit, it's covered. So then I put a second coat on to get make sure i got metallic orientation, and I'm done. Two coats and it's done. And I'll tell you what, 10 years ago, not even 10 years ago, there was colors, and I mean, even in the waterboard, there's colors that I remember when I was working in a shop, there was like a, one that really sticks out to me was a Ford color, and it was an orange pearl, and I remember putting 12 or 13 coats of base on a vehicle, because you had to keep applying the color to get the depth to make it match, and I mean, waterboard, so you put a coat on, and then you'd have to bake it for 10 minutes, and then you'd have to go in with your little temperature thing after it cooled off again because it had to be at a certain temperature to prove that that paint was within your usable, workable window. So you put 13 coats on. I mean, that's an afternoon of putting base on for a panel that you get paid an hour and a half to paint, and you just spent three hours just putting your color on it, never mind everything else you got to do. So that's bullshit. That, that, is, that is some stinky bullshit. Um... So a lot of the companies, oh, they know what they've done as far as making their colors suck. So they just started going backwards. They just started putting more meat back in the sandwich again. And uh, so it winds up getting so that your booth isn't carrying enough, as much out the top anymore, right? Like you're not blowing as much through the ceiling out the fans. So it starts to pass their sniffers. But... An odd thing is that, uh, what the hell did they have there when they painted it? Um, clear coats. We've never used anything but, but a urethane clear. And I don't know if you've ever, any of you have ever seen or been in a paint booth with something's painting something or clearing something, but when you're basing something, there's not much going on there. But when you're clearing something, there's a fog in there. I mean, there's a London morning fog going on in that paint booth of clear. <sighs> getting pumped right out but that's okay because the paint companies told them we can't do nothing about that this is what we can do to help you out we can uh, we can change the base coats we're not changing the sealers we're not changing the primers we're not changing anything except for the simplest layer the thinnest layer the least amount that you're putting on there that's the stuff that we can change because the guys over in Denmark they've already come up with the technology for us to steal to do that so uh that's kind of uh, what I'm. That's that's kind of the rise and fall of it. You know, like I said, now uh, the matrix I have has gone back to solvent, and in the states it's VOC compliant, volatile organic chemical compliant, um, and there's quite a few paint lines that have managed to go back to solvent and be VOC compliant. Why? Because they just went back in time. They just went back to their older formulas that they used to use 30 years ago. Their their production bases and stuff on their paints, and it's not all getting pumped out the fans anymore. Luckily, though, that because now that it's solvent, they can charge three times as much as they did before. So, I mean, the solvent-borne stuff is probably it costs every bit as much as they raised the waterborne to. So they're still making their money. It's just more user-friendly because waterborne paint's really a bummer. Um, I've used it out here many times. Um, RM I used for quite a while. And uh, pretty much anything that went on out here would change my color. I painted a, uh, I don't know what Dodge calls it, burnt orange, I think they call it, but like back in the 70s. But it's a really nice copper color. And I did a demon. And uh, a demon. Oh. And uh, so I did it in pieces. I painted the shell of the car. <clears throat> then I painted the fenders in two goes. Um, I did the, how did I do that? I think I did the doors and the trunk lid together, and then I did the fenders and the hood together, and uh, everything came out a different color. Nice, hey? Every batch. The doors and the trunk lid matched, but they didn't match the body of the car. Fenders and the hood were the same color, but they didn't match the doors or the body of the car. So it was three different colors. I repainted the whole goddamn car. The initial paint that I did on that car, I fished all the paint out of the same bucket, 
The same guy painted it with the same paint gun and the same paint booth with the same everybody. Same sealer, same clear coat. It was all done within a matter of days with all the same products. And it all came out different. And the difference was the humidity in the air. Changed the way the paint dried because I just use a cross flow booth. I can't create uh, my own environment in there. Whatever, it's the way she goes. And uh, yeah, it was a different environment being pulled through that booth and it changed the way that that paint dried and it changed the color of the paint. So <laughs> thumbs down, don't like it. The solvent borne stuff, it's just like the old paint, it don't matter what you do. If you put it on heavy, it gets darker. If you put it on light, it gets lighter. Those are your only variables. Otherwise, you, you, you spray what you spray, you get what you get. So, so uh, yeah, I don't know. Does that make sense? Does anybody give a shit? Like that's 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 what happened. That's the rise and fall. That's where uh, um, that's where waterborne paint come from, and now that's where waterborne paint is going because not as many places use it around here. I don't know what it's like where you live because I know that none of you are here. You're all there. Nobody's here. I'm the only one here. You guys are all over there. But uh, that's what happened with it here. Like I said, I know that for a fact because I witnessed it. I worked in the trade and I saw it happen um, day by day, week by week, month by month. I saw it happening. Uh, and as a guy who's spraying it and doing it, it pissed you off while it was happening. You know, like I said, you went from uh, being able to spend a limited amount of time getting your job done to just pumping time out the window. And time is money. You get paid your time. I was always flat rate. So I didn't get paid by the, I got paid by the hour, but I got paid by the job. I didn't get paid eight hours a day. I got paid for how much work I could produce in that day. So when they're screwing you over with the paint companies and all that kind of stuff, no bueno. That's a bummer. But, uh, yeah, I just thought I'd throw a video out there while I was struggling with I'm going to take this door outside and I'm going to, uh, I'm going to walk around it with a blaster because, uh, there, I don't think there's no metal down in the bottom of my door here. I don't think there's very little steel going on here at all. So I'm going to have, I've already stripped the outside, so I'm going to blast the inside off and then I'm going to dig the filler out and see what they've done underneath the filler. And like I said, I don't think that there's anything down there, so I'm going to have to build some lower corners of these doors. I don't really like having to do that, but that's the way she goes. Maybe I'll see what a lower door section is worth. It might be worth me buying a lower inner door section just to cut the corners out to weld the corners in. The GM parts guy opens up in another five minutes, so I think I'll be making a phone call and seeing what he's got. What he's got for me. Anyways, though, that wasn't about this door. That was about the rise and fall of waterborne paint. There you go. What do you think? Arguments? Go ahead and argue. Come at me with something, would you? See ya.